It was announced, and the piece of paper in the back of the building says that we're going to study the Gospel of John, but I have changed my mind. Um, I'm allowed to do that, I think. And uh, we are going to study something that John wrote. Uh, It is going to be the book of Revelation, however. And it's... uh, with always with a little bit of uh, intimidation, I guess, that I open the book of Revelation. It is a difficult book to read. Uh, even after you think you've got it kind of figured out, there's still pieces of it that are difficult and still make you kind of scratch your head. But I'd like for us to see if we can't go through the book and uh, get a sense of what the book is about. I'd like for us to start this evening by talking about the kind of book that the book of Revelation is. Uh, that's an important place to start because if somebody tells us, well, this is a history book, and then we say, okay, well, I know what to expect. I'm going to hear about people and what they did, maybe dates and places. Or if somebody says, well, this book is a book of poetry, say, well, okay, I'll, I'll know what to expect there. Maybe not so many dates and names and places, but uh, a lot of language expressing ideas and emotions and, and things like that. Or if somebody says, well, this book is a gospel, it's a biography, well, we know what to expect. I think we are probably, most of us, however, not so sure what to expect when we open the book of Revelation, because it's not a history book, it's not a biography, it's not poetry. As a matter of fact, it's, it's hardly any of the things that we're normally used to seeing when we open a book of the Bible. It is instead a rather interesting and different kind of book that is called apocalyptic literature. And I'd like for us to think this evening about what apocalyptic literature is like so that when we uh, start to look at the book of Revelation, we have some sense of just what it is that we are looking at. Now, uh, the plan next week is to talk about the date of the book and uh, some other internal matters. I think that that is a crucial question when studying the book of Revelation. And it's crucial because of uh, a very simple point, and that is that the book is about something. It's not just about anything. It's not just about generic ideas. It's about something. John wrote it to particular people about something. And so it behooves us to find out what it was about that John was writing. And we're going to talk about that next week, Lord willing, and I'll make my case for what I think is going on there. But tonight we want to get a kind of a a more general picture of what this kind of book is like, what it's like uh, to read apocalyptic literature. Uh, The word apocalyptic, if you're not familiar with that term, no need to really be afraid of it. It's from a Greek word, apokalupsis, so we get it straight from Greek, and it simply means an uncovering or a revealing. So apocalyptic literature is literature that claims to reveal certain things. Now we might say, well, doesn't all of the Bible do that? Doesn't the Bible reveal to us the mind of God? Yes, but apocalyptic revealing is a special kind of revealing. It's not where an apostle stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, you know, uh, husbands love your wives or something like that. And it's not the kind of uh, book where an inspired writer or a a prophet will say, this is what Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed. No, there's a special insight that is associated with this literature. And so it is called apocalyptic uh, in a very special sense. And uh, the term itself is used in two ways, and we don't need to get really hung up on this, but uh, it, it just kind of helps to know this. Uh, The term apocalyptic is used of the literature, the kind of writing that this book is. And so when we say that it is apocalyptic, what we can mean by that is that it is a certain kind of writing. Just like biography is a certain kind of writing, history or poetry are different kinds of writing, so apocalyptic is a particular kind of writing, or if you're familiar with the word genre. It is a kind of literature that has its own set of characteristics. And every time you uh, write one of these, you impart uh, those characteristics to it. Uh, The term can also, however, denote the ideas and the concepts that are expressed in the writing. So apocalyptic is not only a kind of literature, it is a kind of thinking as well. 
And we'll talk a little bit this evening about the apocalyptic mentality or the apocalyptic worldview because it's a very, very important part of uh, not only the book of Revelation, but the New Testament as well. Uh, the fact is, you probably already know some things about some apocalyptic literature. There's more than one piece of this in the Bible. The book of Daniel is an apocalyptic piece of literature or is apocalyptic literature. Uh, you've ever read Daniel uh, chapters 2, 3, and 4, Daniel's vision of the statue, or Nebuchadnezzar's vision that Daniel interprets. And then in Daniel 7, Daniel sees these really weird-looking beasts coming up out of the ground and uh, tells us what all of that is about. And he has visions. He sees God in heaven, the Son of Man, and, and he sees angels. Uh, that's apocalyptic literature. The book of Ezekiel is apocalyptic. If you think Daniel is strange, read the book of Ezekiel. He sees all kinds of weird things. And uh, Matthew 24 is an example in the New Testament where Jesus talks about wars, rumors of war, signs in the heavens, the stars falling out of the sky, the sun being darkened, the moon being turned into blood. Well, Jesus was engaging in apocalyptic language there to describe what we understand as the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24. The same thing in uh, Mark 13, and the parallel is, uh, I think, Luke 22 or something like that. So uh, if you are familiar with those books and those passages, how they just kind of sound strange to us, and they use weird language and say strange things, uh, you're already familiar a little bit with this kind of literature. The interesting thing is, though, there's a lot more of this stuff outside of the Bible among the Jews. And you may not have ever heard of any of these books, and that's okay. You don't really need to know anything about them other than to know that there's a bunch of them. Uh, the Book of Enoch, the Book of the Assumption of Moses, the Apocalypse of Baruch, the Book of Second Esdras. Yeah, there is a second as opposed to a first and third and fourth. Uh, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Sibylline Oracles, the Book of Jubilees, and finally a Christian document written in the second century called the Shepherd of Hermas. Now again, you may not have ever heard of any of those, and that's okay. You don't need to know about any of these. But the point is that the Jews were reading this stuff all the time. Uh, these books were written in the period between the Old and New Testaments, in that intertestamental period. And it is a very popular and a very widespread kind of literature among Jews, and even the Christians as well partake of it in the Shepherd of Hermas. And so it's strange to us, and uh, I don't know really of anything, I don't read a whole lot of modern literature myself, I'm not up on, you know, famous books and things like that, but uh, I was trying to think of an example of a modern apocalyptic text um, I've been told that that book by uh, Salman Rushdie, what was that book that got him his death threat? Satanic Verses. That's kind of an apocalyptic book. I didn't read the Satanic Verses, but I've been told it's kind of on that order. Uh, it's not as prevalent, perhaps, as in our society as it was in ancient times, but it was prevalent to them. They were much more familiar with it. So what I'd like for us to do is think about uh, the characteristics of this literature this evening, and just kind of start from the beginning and see the picture develop. Number one, this kind of literature was only produced in times of perceived crisis and conflict. That's the only time this stuff gets written, when there is a serious problem going on. People get in trouble. Life is not going the way they thought it should go. Maybe there's suffering. There might even be persecution. And people of faith start to wonder what in the world is going on. And how can I make sense of everything? Well, this kind of literature was written to help people cope with crises and conflicts in their lives. It is therefore a response to people's suffering and confusion. Now, that being said, we look at the book of Revelation and we start to get a glimpse of what it's about. 
that it was written to people who were suffering and confused, who didn't know what to make of what was going on around them, who all of a sudden looked at the world and it didn't make any sense to them anymore. And so John sits down to say, let me explain this to you. Let me tell you how things are so that you understand what's going on. And more than any other place in the Bible, this kind of literature talks about suffering. There's a lot about suffering in apocalyptic literature because that's what was on people's mind in times of conflict and crisis. So the question that we want to ask is, what is the crisis that the original readers of the book of Revelation were facing? And I want you to think about that one because we're going to provide an answer for that next week. But I want you to think about what might the crisis, what was the conflict, the problem that was going on that John had to write this book to answer. Be thinking about that, if you will, uh, over the next few days. But there's more to it than that. Secondly, apocalyptic literature presents information in the form of a story. Now, you know, you can write an essay on the problem of suffering, and, you know, you might say, well, I'm just going to write this and maybe publish it in a book or in a magazine or something like that so that people can pick it up and read it. But that's not what apocalyptic literature does. It doesn't just say, now, let's think about three things about the problem of suffering or let's consider four facets or three answers. No, apocalyptic literature says, let's think of this in terms of a story. Let's explain this as a narrative. And this is the very point, I think, where some people kind of take the wrong step when they start to read the book of Revelation. The details of the story that you and I are going to read are not necessarily historical events that are to come. So you're going to read stories in this book. You're going to read a bunch of stories. And one of our first reactions is to read one of these stories and say, okay, it said in the story that this happens, then this, then this. So what are those events? Well, that's not what the story is trying to tell us. It's not necessarily about this thing's going to happen, then this, and then this. The story is not trying to give us a chronological view of the future or a calendar. In other words, this is not some kind of history written beforehand where an author is saying, let me predict the future for you. There's going to be seven events happen. They're going to happen in this order, and I'm going to tell you the order of them. That's not what's going on here. It's more like the parables of Jesus than it is anything else. And if we understand the parables, we can understand this. You, may, you, you understand the parables, I think, and you know the situation. People would come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we think that maybe you're the Messiah, and we know that the kingdom of God is going to come very, very soon. So could you please tell us about the coming of this kingdom? We, we sense that it is near. And Jesus would say, well, it's kind of like a guy that went out and started throwing seed all over the place. He's throwing it out there in the road and throwing it over there on the thorns and throwing it out there where the birds can get it. And some of it winds up falling on the ground. And, and that stuff grows really good, but that other stuff, it doesn't have a chance. To look at Jesus and say, yeah, but when are you going to tell us about the kingdom? You know, we want to know, is it going to be next week? Are you going to start the war today? Next year, should we get swords together? And Jesus was telling them the story not to tell them when or the sequence of events that would bring it about. The point of Jesus' stories was to tell them this is what the kingdom is like. And if you walked away from Jesus saying, yeah, but when is it going to happen, then you miss the point. And the book of Revelation is like that. It's not to tell the early Christians or us when things were going to happen. It's designed to tell us the nature of what God was going to do and the outcome. Now, we like to know when, don't we? We get done reading the book of Revelation, we say, okay, when did this happen? And I think if John could be here, he'd say, don't worry about when. It doesn't matter when. 
if it happens now or 20 years from now or 100 years from now, God's going to take care of that. What God wants you to know is the nature of this thing. He wants you to know the outcome. He wants you to understand the big picture here. And that's what we have to know. And so there's going to be the temptation, I think, often for us to look at a story in the book of Revelation and, you know, we see the Lion of Judah opens a book with seven seals. And as he opens, pops each seal open, something happens. And we look at that and we say, okay, what was that? When did that happen? And what was the next event? It's not one event after another. It's a description of God's plan. It is a description of the nature of what God is doing, not when he is doing it. And I don't know if I'm making my point uh, sufficiently clear, but uh, hopefully we can start to get our minds wrapped around it. What was the crisis that caused the book of Daniel to be written? Where were the Jews? Babylonian captivity. The world had turned upside down. God has allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed. Here we are in a foreign land. I can't believe this is happening. Has God abandoned us? Is this the end of the world? Are we going to die out here? Daniel writes his book to say, no, not at all. Ezekiel, the same situation, right? People in Babylonian captivity wondering what in the world has gone on here. Ezekiel says, let me tell you about that. Well, same is true here with the book of Revelation. It is addressing a world that has been turned upside down. Thirdly, this is Milton's question. The story is highly symbolic and abounds with figurative and symbolic language. And that's the thing about the apocalyptic literature that usually strikes us as being so strange. One of my favorite stories in the book is chapter 12. If you've never heard this story, it's a great story. A sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. The moon was under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and she cried out being in labor, giving birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven crowns. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth he might devour her child. You've never read anything like that, I'll guarantee you, anywhere else. That's some story, isn't it? That's weird stuff. Well, why? Why? Why does it have to be so weird? Because it's emphatic. The author is trying to make a point in the most drastic kind of way. It heightens the sense of the crisis and it heightens the sense of the solution when the solution finally comes along. And not only that, it imparts a sense of the cosmic dimensions of the struggle. We saw a little bit of this in the book of Ephesians where Paul says, there's a lot that's gone on before Jesus came that you ought to know about, that from the very beginning, God has been planning your salvation and, and making it happen. And so there's a lot up there in heaven that's been going on behind the scenes. The book of Revelation is trying to show us that as well, that there's things going on in the heavenly realm that uh, are much bigger than we can possibly understand, that this struggle is not just... Uh, on earth, but is even greater. Let me illustrate it this way. Which makes the greater impression on you? If I say our society is often pressuring us to do things we do not want to do as Christians, or I say that we are engaged in a war with this, a beast with seven heads ten horns, and so forth. Which makes the greater impression on you? The second one, right? That's the point of all this language. This is not just, I'm having a bad day, or we might be in for a few rough weeks here. No. This is it. This is the crisis of crises. I mean, what if you walked out your front door tomorrow morning and saw this? you would think something has gone wrong with the world someplace, right? I hope you'd think that. 
after you, <laughs> after you, you know, dropped your jaw and, and called the police or whatever, you'd, you'd say, man, something is wrong someplace. That's the point of all this language, that something is horribly wrong with the universe, that things are, are wrong to a great extent, far greater than you can imagine, and that the fight that we are engaged in, the conflict and the struggle is this kind of big. So it's not just, you know, don't worry about it, we'll get over it. No, it's this is what you have to face. Revelation 17, John said, I saw a red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, seated on the dragon was a prostitute clothed in purple. Now it's one thing to say, I think the Roman government has overstepped its bounds. It's another thing to say, that that's the Roman government. That's a much more vivid picture, isn't it? That gives you a better idea of what I'm talking about, that this thing is evil, it's hideous, it's grotesque, it's dangerous, it's seductive, it's evil. And when you say it that way, you really get the point. And so why use all this weird language? Because it's trying to make the point of the magnitude of the situation. D.S. Russell wrote a book on apocalyptic literature. He says this, the apocalyptic literature is marked by a highly dramatic quality, highly dramatic, whose language and style match the inexpressible scenes which it tries to portray. Such scenes cannot be portrayed in the sober language of common prose. They require for their expression the imaginative language of poetry, but it is poetry quite unlike the restrained language of the Old Testament scriptures. The apocalyptists give full rein to their imaginations in extravagant and exotic language and in imagery of a fantastic and bizarre kind. To such an extent is this true that symbolism may be said to be the language of apocalyptic. <coughs> fantastic and bizarre to make the point, right? Uh, Ray Summers in his book on Revelation says, Revelation is addressed chiefly to the imagination. Now normally we tell people don't use your imagination when reading the Bible, just listen to what it says, right? This is a book where you gotta use your imagination, you gotta envision what's being talked about. As the expositor reads the book, he must seek to see in his mind's eye the various episodes intense with drama. Unless the reader can do this, he will miss the greatest messages of Revelation. The man who has not or has and refuses to use a fertile imagination will do well to leave this book alone. This book was written to yield its message by creating an impression. And this impression makes itself realized as one yields himself to the drama that is enacted before him on the stage in Asia Minor in 1890 to 96. John's painting a picture, telling us a really weird story to make an impression on us about the magnitude of this message. When we go through these stories, you don't have to find the meaning of every detail. Not every detail has a meaning. It's just part of the story. And it's the impression and the point of that story that we want to get. There's more to it than that, but we'll see later. Uh, number four, the symbolic story reveals truths or outcomes that are otherwise unknown. This is not somebody saying, I think it's going to be okay. Or don't worry, have faith in God. We believe that God will do it. No, the author of an apocalyptic uh, book says, I've got information that nobody else knows that God has spoken to me, and I know something that nobody else knows. It reveals things that are not obvious, or that no one could foresee by human means. If you could get back into a time machine, or let's just say you lived back in the first century, in the Roman Empire, would you in your wildest imaginations ever have dreamed that the Roman Empire would collapse? It was the greatest empire the world had ever seen. John says, I'm going to tell you a little secret. It's going to fall. <coughs> Nobody would have predicted that. Nobody would have thought that that was going to happen. It's a revelation. It is prophecy in this sense 
But not just ordinary prophecy. It's that vivid, bizarre, fantastic telling of prophecy. It's not going to fall. It's going to crash and burn. John says it's like a mountain that falls out of the sky and the seas are, are splashed dry. That's the fall of this thing. And so it's not just I'm telling you facts. It's I'm telling you big facts. It always involves a messenger or a message from a heavenly messenger. It also comes in visions or dreams or maybe all of them. We'll see all of them in the book of Revelation. John will have visions. He will see things. And angels will tell him things. And this kind of gets to Milton's question as well. The message often includes interpretation by the heavenly messenger. There are several places in the book where John will say, I saw this. And then an angel will come up to him and say, do you know what that means? And John will say, no, I don't. And the angel will say, well, let me tell you. Sometimes you'll hear the idea that the symbolic language of the book of Revelation was meant to hide its message from the enemies. That's not true. If it were meant to hide, we shouldn't be getting explanations in it. But we do. The angels tell us what things mean from time to time. And there are some symbols that are so clear that you don't need help in understanding them. They, they interpret themselves. It's not designed to hide the message from the enemy. Uh, the, the symbolic language, as we suggested, has a different function. That doesn't mean it's always easy. If you've ever read the book of Ezekiel, whenever Ezekiel asks for help in understanding something, the explanation is way harder than the symbol ever was. There's a little bit of that in the book of Revelation as well. John says, I saw this dragon with ten horns. What are the ten horns? Oh boy, you wish you hadn't asked that one. They are ten kings. Seven who have come already, one that is, and two more that are yet to come. What is that talking about? Who knows? But, uh, you know... There's interpretation that goes along with it. But the point is that nobody would have figured this out on their own. Fifthly, the revelation that comes from heaven presents a view of the heavenly realm. It's not about just the earth. And again, it's not history. The author's not saying, well, this is going to happen, then this and this. He says, let's pull back the curtain here, folks. Let's uh, stick our head inside the door, as it were, and see the big picture, the realities of heaven and what's going on where you can't see it. And so it is this big picture view that we saw a little bit of in the book of Ephesians, chapters 1, 2, and 3, but here it's even bigger. It is a view behind the scenes, as it were, to explain to you why things look the way they are. Kind of like a car. You know, you imagine somebody that had never seen a car before in their life. They would think you just get in this thing and it just moves. And it goes places. Well, you know, you pop the hood and you say, well, there's actually like a mechanical thing in here that makes it move and you have to do this. And, and when you see what's under the hood, then you understand why it does what it does. That's what John is going to do. He's going to let us see under the hood, as it were. Why is the world the way it is? John says, I'll explain it to you. I'll show you. And not only that, it's not just about the way things are, but it is meant to provide a perspective on the present sufferings, the present crisis, and the conflict. So like we said, it's the author's way of saying, let me help explain this to you. You think that that maybe God doesn't care about you because you're suffering and, and it just goes on and on and on and there doesn't seem to be any relief in sight. Uh, your enemies are prospering, getting stronger every day and you wonder how can this be the will of God? John says, I'm going to explain all of that to you. I'm going to let you see something that you normally don't get to see and once you've seen that, then you'll understand why it is the way it is down here and it'll seem a lot better to you. You won't be so confused anymore. And that doesn't mean it answers every question because there are still things that, you know, after we've read the book of Revelation, we might say, boy, I wish I knew the answer to this. But it gives us a different perspective on the difficulties that Christians face, and it helps them, it helps the readers deal with their earthly situation and helps them to endure it. Because ultimately, this is not just about what's going on in the present. 
The big bang of the book and of apocalyptic literature is that there is a judgment coming. And people who are suffering, you know, the big question is, why am I suffering? And then the second question is, how long do I have to suffer? Go through this. Well, John's going to peel back the curtain and say, this is why you're suffering. And you hear that second question at the very beginning of the book. In the throne scene in chapter 5, the souls under the altar cry out, how long, O oh Lord? And the answer comes in the book. God says, I'm going to take care of your enemy. I'm going to fix them. And I'm not just going to beat them down to where they're weaker than you. I'm going to destroy them. They're not going to be around anymore when I get done with them, God says. I'm going to beat them down so bad they'll never come back. And so the message is, hold on, because God is going to take care of your enemies. He's going to fix them, and he's going to vindicate you. In other words, God is about to break into the situation. And the characteristic of apocalyptic language is that when God does this, he doesn't do it in a sneaky way. He doesn't do it in such a way that you never would have guessed it had gone on. You know about it. That God is about to do something drastic and it's going to be violent. There's some pretty bloody chapters in the book of Revelation. John talks about one scene where God has killed so many of the enemy that the blood is up to the horse's bridles for 600 miles in every direction. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of dead people. God's going to do that to your enemy. Violent and relatively suddenly. Now that's the part, again, that, that we have trouble with. Behold, I come quickly, the book of Revelation says. And we want to say, yeah, but when, when, when? But God's point is, oh, it's going to happen. Don't worry about when. It's going to happen like lightning, and it might not be tomorrow, it might not be next month, but man, it is coming. And it's not going to be the end of time either. It's going to happen. And so watch out for what God is going to do. It is a coming time of God setting things right. And it's going to be public. You hear in the book of Revelation, God, say, God says like in chapter 17, 16, 17, and 18, when I get done with your enemy, the entire world is going to hold its breath. They're not going to believe what I've done to these people. You hear that kind of thing in Jeremiah, don't you? Remember what Jeremiah said as the word of the Lord? Behold, I am going to do to this people such that will make their ears tingle whenever they hear it. You know, I'm going to beat them so bad that, that you won't believe it. That's the apocalyptic mentality as well. That God's not just going to fix it. He's going to really fix it. And he's going to fix it in a way that is final. Now, final not in the sense of the end of time. But in the sense that when I get done messing with this, it's never going to be a problem again. That kind of final. There's a coming apocalyptic event, in other words. There's going to be a drastic action by God in which the old existing order of things that has become corrupted and is even hostile to God and to us, when all of that is superseded, when wrongs are set right, wickedness is judged, righteousness is manifested, and a new order of things appears. Can anybody think of an apocalyptic event in the Bible, in the Old Testament? There are several of them. The flood is the mother of all apocalyptic events. The world's filled with wickedness. God says, bam, I'm going to fix that. And in one afternoon, the world is wiped out. Forty days, as it were. Just a snap of God's finger, they're all dead. The world is washed clean and a man of righteousness is left. God has judged the wicked. Can you think of another apocalyptic event in the Bible? Sodom and Gomorrah? What's another one? Destruction of Jerusalem is a big one. The, the surprise about that one is that God did it to his own people. What about the crossing of the Red Sea? God killing the Egyptians, that's another one. You start thinking through Bible history, they're actually pretty common. That this is normally the way God does things. He's patient. But when God's patience runs out, look out, because he's going to come and he is going to destroy what is wicked and nothing's going to be left standing. You ever read the first verse of the book of Zephaniah? God says, I'm going to destroy every living thing on the earth. 
trees, animals, man, everything. And that's not an apocalyptic book, but it's that idea, right? God says, I've had it, I've been, I'm fed up with this, and I'm going to fix it. Number eight, the message is also that the kingdom of God will overcome and all enemies and rival kingdoms, and it will endure. The saints are going to be protected. We're going to see that over and over in the book of Revelation. That before God does something, he says, let's wait a minute. I'm going to draw a circle around my people. Or I'm going to stretch a line over there. Or I'm going to write my name on their forehead so that they're protected. And I'm going to kill all the wicked, but I'm going to spare the righteous. So the message is, God's going to take care of you. He's not going to just destroy the world and you go up in flames with it. He's just going to destroy your enemies. You're going to be left standing when this is all done. The kingdom of God will endure and even if they do kill you, you haven't lost anything because the saints live. Even if they kill your body, you will live and you will see the victory of God in the end. And your enemies will be in a place of torment, shut off, and you will be walking in the city of God with God, enjoying your victory and the fruits of your faith. And so, don't worry. The message, therefore, gives hope in a situation of perceived silence and inactivity. Where's God? Why isn't God doing anything? Why isn't God helping us? Why isn't God defeating our enemy? Has God withdrawn from the world? Does He not care? Can He not do anything? The book of Revelation says, oh, God's going to do something. And you better believe that it's going to take care of the situation. God is not unconcerned. He is watching everything that's going on. He has not withdrawn from the world. He is intimately involved in it. God is going to act. And the message is not directed toward the entire world. It's directed toward the insiders. The message is, you be ready for it. It's going to take the world by surprise, but don't let it take you by surprise. Mary, isn't that what Jesus said about the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24? I'm telling you these things, these signs beforehand, so that when it comes, you know to flee the city. They're not going to know, but you will. You can get out, but they'll die. Finally, we're running out of time this evening. The message includes moral exhortation and warning to God's people. God's going to come and destroy the wicked. And so the book will tell us also, don't you be part of that now. Don't you get involved with the wicked people out there in the world. God's going to destroy them. And if you happen to be one of them, you're going to get destroyed too. If you compromise with the world, you're going to get condemned with it. What you need to do is tough it out. <coughs> Stick with it. Be faithful. Because in the end, you will win. And they won't be here anymore. Very quickly, even though not all the literature in the Bible is apocalyptic literature, Many of the biblical writers and all of the New Testament writers have this way of thinking. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not before, but they all view the world in terms of a great conflict and that God is going to someday soon fix it. Romans 16.20. Now, Romans is not an apocalyptic literature, but in Romans 16.20, God, or Paul says, God will crush Satan under your feet. There's a conflict going on, and God's going to fix it. That's that mentality, even though it's not that weird literature. Galatians 4, 4 through 5, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a virgin, under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the curse of the law. There was a problem, and boom, God took care of it. Ephesians 2, 5 through 6, even though we were dead in our sins and trespasses, he has made us alive together in Christ. He has raised us up to seat uh, us with him in the heavenly places. Bam, God has intervened, fixed the situation. Romans 6, or Ephesians 6, 12, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, of uh, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul's talking about the Israelites who died in the wilderness. With most of them, God was displeased and their dead bodies fell in the wilderness. Psalm 95, it's quoted in Hebrews 3 and verse 4. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. 
For God swore in his wrath, they shall not enter my wrath. God got tired of it. He judged them, and he had a new people come along that would go into the land. That's apocalyptic. And so hopefully you can get a sense this evening of what kind of book this is and what it's going to try to say to us.